The Rolls-Royce Griffon engine was designed in answer to Royal Naval specifications for an engine capable of generating good power at low altitudes. The concepts for adapting the Spitfire to take the new engine had begun as far back as October 1939. Joseph Smith felt that the good big un will eventually beat the good little un. And Ernest Hibbs of Rolls-Royce thought that the Griffon would be a second power string for the Spitfire. The first of the Griffon engine Spitfires flew on November 27, 1941. Although the Griffon engine Spitfires were never produced in the large numbers of the Merlin engine variants, they were an important part of the Spitfire family and, in their later versions, kept the Spitfire at the forefront of piston engine fighter development. This article describes the Griffon powered Spitfire variants. Wing types The majority of Spitfires, from the MK 8 on, used three basic wing types a Euro the C through to the E types. Unless otherwise noted all Griffon engine Spitfire variants used the strength and Dunlop AH100194 spoke pattern and heels. With the increasing use of hard surfaced runways in the post-war years many Spitfires were either manufactured, or retrofitted with, larger man heels which were of a three-spoke pattern. These were used on modified undercarriage legs which had reduced tone for the axles, which reduced tire scrub. Equals C type equals, also known as the universal wing the new design was standard on the majority of Spitfires built from mid-1942. This wing was structurally modified to reduce labor and manufacturing time plus it was designed to allow mixed armament options. A type, B type, or 420mm Hispano cannon. The undercarriage mountings were redesigned and the undercarriage doors were bowed in cross-section allowing the legs to sit lower in the wells, eliminating the upper wing blisters over the wheel wells and landing gear pivot points. Stronger undercarriage legs were raked two inches forward, making the Spitfire more stable on the ground and reducing the likelihood of the aircraft tipping onto its nose. During production of the MK-8 and MK-9 a new undercarriage leg was introduced which had external V-shaped scissor links fitted to the front of the leg. This also led to small changes in the shape of the undercarriage bay and leg fairings. Several versions of the Spitfire, including MK-14 and MK-XVIIIs had extra 13-gallon integral fuel tanks in the wing leading edges between the wing route and the inboard cannon bay. The Hispano MKIIs were now belt-fed from box magazines allowing for 120 RPG. The fairings over the Hispano barrels were shorter and there was usually a short rubber stub covering the outer cannon port. Redesigned upper wing gun bay doors incorporated teardrop-shaped blisters to clear the cannon feed motors, and the lower wings no longer had the gun bay heating vents outboard of the gun bays. In order to provide room for the belt feed system of the cannon the inner machine gun bays were moved outboard to between ribs 13 and 14. As the Spitfire was no longer to be used as a night fighter, the retractable landing lights were no longer fitted. Equals D type equals, these were specifically made for the photo reconnaissance Spitfires, including the PR-19. No armament was fitted in the D-shaped leading edges of the wings, ahead of the main spar were converted into integral fuel tanks, each carrying 66 gallons. To avoid the expansion of fuel in hot weather damaging the wing, pressure relief valves, incorporating small external vent pipes, were fitted near the wing tips. Equals E type equals, structurally unchanged from the C wing. The outer machine gun ports were eliminated, although the outer machine gun bays were retained and their access doors were devoid of empty cartridge case ports and cartridge case deflectors. The inner gun bays allowed for two weapon fits. Two a 20mm Hispano MK2 cannon with 120 rounds per gun in the outer bays combined with two a .50 calories Browning M2 machine guns, with 250 RPG in the inner bays. With of the relocation of the Hispano to the outer gun bay the blisters covering the feed motors were moved outboard on the gun bay doors. Or. For a, 20mm Hispano cannon with 120 RPG. The 20mm Hispano cannon were moved outboard and a more effective .50 caliber Browning .50 color is M2 slash AN heavy machine gun with 250 RPG was added to the inner gun bay replacing the outer Browning .303s. The first trial installation of the installation was made in BS-118, 
a Mark 11 in November 1943. This armament later became standard for all Spitfire MKX IVs used by two TAF as fighters. The improved armament was more effective for both air-to-air -air engagements and air-to-ground attacks. The MK-12 flew operationally with their rounded wing tips replaced by shorter, squared-off fairings. The single-stage supercharger of the Griffon 2 or 4 used in the MKXIIs meant that it was rated and used as a low-altitude fighter, and the LF prefix used by Merlin-powered Spitfires was never applied. Starting in early 1945 most Spitfire MKXIVs also used clipped wingtips, mainly in an effort to reduce wrinkling of the wing skin. Again the LF prefix was not applied to these aircraft. Equals redesigned late wing equals, as the Spitfire gained more power and was able to fly at greater speeds the possibility was that pilots would encounter aileron reversal so the Supermarine design team set about redesigning the wings to counter this possibility. The original wing design had a theoretical aileron reversal speed of 580 miles per hour, which was somewhat lower than that of some contemporary fighters. The new wing of the Spitfire FMK-21 and its successors was designed to help alleviate this problem. The wing's stiffness was increased by 47%, and a new design of aileron using penno hinges and gear trim tabs meant that the theoretical aileron reversal speed was increased to 825 miles per hour. The standard armament was now for 20mm Hispano IIs or the shorter, lighter Hispano V cannons each with 150 rounds per gun. Variants equals Notes equals, The mark numbers used in the aircraft designations did not necessarily indicate a chronological order. For example, the MK-9 was a stopgap measure brought into production before the MKS-7 and 8. Some Spitfires of one mark or variant may have been modified to another. For example, several of the first MKVBs were converted from MKIBs. The first MKIXs were originally MKVCs. Up until the end of 1942, the RAF always used Roman numerals for mark numbers. 1943 to 1948 was a transition period during which new aircraft entering service were given Arabic numerals for mark numbers but older aircraft retained their Roman numerals. From 1948 onwards, Arabic numerals were used exclusively. Thus, the Spitfire Prairie MK-19 became the PR-19 after 1948. This article adopts the convention of using Roman numerals for the MKSI-19 and Arabic numerals for the MKS-21-24. Type numbers are the drawing board design numbers allocated by Supermarine. Equals MK-420 equals, on December 4, 1939, the Supermarine design staff produced a brochure which mooted the idea of converting the Spitfire to use the Rolls-Royce Griffon engine. A top speed of 423 miles per hour at 18,500 feet was predicted. However, constant problems with the development of the Griffon meant that the decision to proceed with building a Spitfire with this engine didn't come to fruition until 1942, with the successful flight trials of the MK-4. The Griffon IIB which powered the MK-4 was a single-stage supercharged engine of 1,735 horsepower stronger main longer ends were needed to cope with the weight of the Griffon and it required a bigger radiator and oil cooler, although it kept the asymmetric underwing radiator layout of the single-stage Merlin marks. The new engine had a lower thrust line than the Merlin and was set with a minus a one-half degree of down thrust. The lower thrust line and larger capacity of the new engine meant that the contours of the engine cowling were completely changed, with more prominent blisters over the cylinder heads, plus a third tier drop shaped blister on the upper forward cowling to clear the magneto, and a deeper curve down to the spinner, which was much longer than previous types. The lower cowling lost its pigeon chested appearance, with a shallower curve up to the spinner. A four blade rotor propeller of 10 feet 5 in was used. Apart from these differences the MK-4 airframe was closely related to that of the Merlin-powered MK-3. One feature of the Griffon engine which was to catch a lot of pilots out was that the propeller rotated in the opposite direction to that of the Merlin. That is, to the left, from the pilot's perspective, rather than to the right. This meant that the powerful slipstream swung the Spitfire to the right on the ground, requiring the rudder to be deflected to the left during takeoff. 
the Mark IV DP-845 first flew on November 27, 1941. It had the full-span C-wing combined with a small tail unit and retractable tail wheel, and also had external bracket hinges under the wings, denoting the installation of braking flaps. These were soon removed and a mock-up of a proposed six-cannon armament was fitted, three in each wing. The aircraft was soon renamed Mk-20, to avoid confusion with a renamed PR type, then it became the Mk-12. Jeffrey Quill, Supermarine's chief test pilot, was the first to fly the Mk-4 Mk-12 prototype DP-845. There was somewhat less ground clearance, resulting in a slight reduction in propeller diameter. The power available for takeoff was much greater. And the engine RPM were lower than in the Merlin. All this meant that the throttle needed to be handled judiciously on takeoff, but, once in the air, the aeroplane had a great feeling of power about it. It seemed to be the airborne equivalent of a very powerful sports car and was great fun to fly. Changes of trim with changes of power were much more in evidence, both directionally and longitudinally and the aeroplane sheared about a bit during tight maneuvers and simulated dogfights. I realized at once that we should have to correct its directional characteristics and probably its longitudinal stability also, both of which in due time we achieved. Indeed, DP-485 eventually went through many phases of development throughout and I, and others, flew in it a great deal. It became one of our favorite aeroplanes. Equals MK-12 equals Media related to Supermarine Spitfire Mark 12 at Wikimedia Commons. The MK 12 was the first Spitfire powered by a Griffon engine to go into service. The first of 100 Supermarine built production aircraft started appearing in October 1942. Two RAF squadrons in total were equipped with the 12. MK XIIs were manufactured from MK VC and MK 8 airframes. Early production aircraft had the fixed tail wheels, Dunlop AH-2061 pattern 5-spoke man heels and small elevator balances. They had a single 85 gallons main fuel tank, giving a short range of little over 380 miles on internal fuel. All were fitted with a larger, pointed tip rudder. The last 45 or so MKXIIs were based on MKVIIs with two wing fuel tanks each containing a maximum fuel load of 14 gallons, and featured the larger horn balances, retractable tailwheel and undercarriage legs with torque links, dish leg fairings and the stronger Dunlop AH-100194 spoke wheels. The wheels were occasionally fitted with disc-style covers. A later model IFF was fitted, replacing the aerials from the tailplane tip to fuselage with a rod aerial under the starboard wing. Another important feature of the Griffon engine Spitfires was the entirely flush riveted finish which was progressively introduced on all Spitfires. The single-stage Griffon engine gave the aircraft superb low and medium level performance, although the MK-12's performance declined at higher altitudes, because of this all production aircraft had clipped wings. In comparative tests with the MK-9 it was 14 miles per hour faster at sea level, but above 20,000 feet it had become slower. Handling, however, was considered to be better than previous Spitfire marks, and the clipped wings conferred excellent maneuverability through enhanced aileron response. At low altitude it was one of the fastest aircraft in the world. In one speed trial, held at Farnborough in July 1942 DP-845 piloted by Jeffrey Quill raced ahead of a Hawker Typhoon and a captured Focke-Wulf FW-190, to the amazement of the dignitaries present. On reflection the general scheme became clear. The Spitfire was to be a sort of datum pacemaker Mr. Average contemporary fighter and its job would be to come in last. The real excitement of the proceedings being by how much it would be beaten by the FW-190 and the Typhoon, and which of these two bright stars would beat the other and by how much. Outside on the tarmac at Worthy Down stood the inoffensive looking but highly potent DP-485. All went according to plan until, when we were about halfway between Adim and Farnborough and going flat out, I was beginning to overhaul the FW-190 and the Typhoon. Suddenly I saw sparks and black smoke coming from the FW-190's exhaust. And I shot past him and never saw him again. 
I was also easily leaving the typhoon behind and the eventual finishing order was, first the Spitfire, second the typhoon, third the FW-190. This was precisely the opposite result to that expected, or indeed intended. It certainly put the cat among the pigeons and among the VIPs. However pilots found it difficult to exploit this advantage in combat as German pilots were reluctant to be drawn into dogfights with Spitfires of any type below 20,000 feet. When the Mk-12 was able to engage in combat it was a formidable fighter and several FW-190s and BF-109GS fell victim to it. The Mk-12 speed advantage at lower altitudes again became useful near the end of its frontline service in summer 1944 in which it shot down a respectable number of V-1 flying bombs, 82.5 the Mk-12 variant was retired in September 1944. Equals Mk-14 equals, media related to Supermarine Spitfire Mark 14 at Wikimedia Commons. The first Griffon-powered Spitfire suffered from poor high-altitude performance due to having only a single-stage supercharged engine. By 1943, Rolls-Royce engineers had developed a new Griffon engine, the 61 series, with a two-stage supercharger. In the end it was a slightly modified engine, the 65 series, which was used in the Mk-14. The resulting aircraft provided a substantial performance increase over the Mk-9. Although initially based on the Mk-8 airframe, Common improvements made in aircraft produced later included the cutback fuselage and teardrop canopies, and the E-type wing with improved armament. The Mk-14 differed from the Mk-12 in that the longer, two-stage supercharged Griffon 65, producing 2,050 horsepower, was mounted 10 inches further forward, the top section of the engine bulkhead was angled forward, creating a distinctive change of angle to the upper cowling's rear edge. A new five-bladed rotor propeller of 10 feet 5 in in diameter was used, although one prototype JF321 was fitted with a six-bladed contra-rotating unit. The fish tail design of ejector exhaust stub gave way to ones of circular section. The increased cooling requirements of the Griffon engine meant that all radiators were much bigger and the underwing housings were deeper than previous versions. The cowling fasteners were new, flush-fitting ammal type and there were more of them. The oil tank was increased in capacity from 6 to 10 gallons. To help balance the new engine the radio equipment was moved further back in the rear fuselage and the access hatch was moved from the left fuselage side to the right. Improved VHF radio equipment allowed for the aerial mast to be removed and replaced by a whip aerial further aft on the fuselage spine. Because the longer nose and the increased slipstream of the big five-bladed propeller a new tail unit, with a taller, broader fin and a rudder of increased area was adopted. The first batch of aircraft to fly with the Griffon 60 series engines were six converted MKVIII's JF-316 to JF-321 which were designated MKVIIG. The first one of these was flown by Jeffrey Quill on January 20, 1943. Changes to the aircraft were restricted to those essential to enable it to accept the new engine. I found that it had a spectacular performance doing 445 miles per hour at 25,000 feet, with a sea level rate of climb of over 5,000 feet per minute. I remember being greatly delighted with it. It seemed to me that from this relatively simple conversion, carried out with a minimum of fuss and bother, had come up with something quite outstanding. The MKVIIG, with virtually the same tail surfaces both vertical and horizontal as the Merlin MK8, was very much overpowered and the handling in the air was unacceptable for an operational type. I soon realized that a new throttle box would be needed giving a much greater angular travel for the hand lever. Your next essential was an improvement in the directional stability and control and a new fin was drawn out with a substantial increase in area and a much larger rudder and fitted to the second aircraft JF-317. This, though not ideal, produced a very marked improvement in directional characteristics and we were able to introduce minor changes thereafter and by various degrees of trimmer tab and balance tab to reach an acceptable degree of directional stability and control. The enlarged fin of JF-317 had a straight leading edge but for production a more elegant curved line was introduced. One prototype, 
JF321, was fitted and tested with a rotor six-bladed contra-rotating propeller unit. Although this promised to eliminate the characteristic swing on takeoff the propeller unit was prone to failure. The pitch control mechanism controlled the pitch on the front propeller. And this was transmitted to the rear propeller through the transitional bearing mechanism. If this failed the pitch of the rear propeller was no longer under control and might do anything which was potentially dangerous. A similar contra-rotating propeller unit was later used on production say FI-46 and 47. When the new fighter entered service with 610 Squadron in December 1943 it signified a new leap forward in the evolution of the Spitfire. Jeffrey Quill flew the first production aircraft, RB-140 in October 1943. So the MK-14 was in business, and a very fine fighter it was. It fully justified the faith of those who, from the early days in 1939, had been convinced that the Griffon engine would eventually see the Spitfire into a new lease of life. It was a splendid aeroplane in every respect. We still had some work to do to improve its longitudinal and directional characteristics, but it was powerful and performed magnificently. The only respect in which the 14 fell short was in its range. It could climb to 20,000 feet in just over five minutes and its top speed, which was achieved at 25,400 feet, was 446 miles per hour. In operational service many pilots initially found that the new fighter could be difficult to handle, particularly if they were used to earlier Spitfire marks. Don Healy of 17 Squadron, based at Majura recalled that the MK-14 was a hairy beast to fly and took some getting used to. I personally preferred the old MK versus from a flying standpoint. Even with full aileron, elevator and rudder, this brute of a fighter took off slightly sideways. In spite of the difficulties pilots appreciated the performance increases. Wing Commander Peter Brothers, O.C. Culm Headwing in 1944-1945 and a Battle of Britain veteran. It was truly an impressive machine. Being able to climb almost vertically, it gave many Luftwaffe pilots the shock of their lives when, having thought they had bounced you from a superior height, they were astonished to find the MK-14 climbing up to tackle them head-on, throttle wide open. FMK XIVs had a total of 109.5 gallons of fuel consisting of 84 gallons in two main tanks and a 12.5 imp gal fuel tank in each leading edge wing tank. In addition, 30. 45, 50 or 90 gallons drop tanks could be carried. The fighter's maximum range was just a little over 460 miles on internal fuel since the new Griffon engine consumed much more fuel per hour than the original Merlin engine of earlier variants. By late 1944, Spitfire XIVs were fitted with an extra 33 gallons in a rear fuselage fuel tank extending the fighter's range to about 850 miles on internal fuel and a 90 gallons drop tank. MK XIVs with teardrop canopies had 64 gallons. As a result, F and FR MK XIVs had a range that was increased to over 610 miles, or 960 miles with a 90 gallons drop tank. The first test of the aircraft was an intercepting V-1 flying bombs, and the MK-14 was the most successful of all Spitfire marks in this role. When 150-octane fuel was introduced in mid-1944 the boost of the Griffon engine was able to be increased to plus 25 pounds, allowing the top speed to be increased by about 30 miles per hour to 400 miles per hour at 2,000 feet. The MK-14 was used by the Second Tactical Air Force as their main high-altitude air superiority fighter in Northern Europe with six squadrons operational by December 1944. One problem which did arise in service was localized skin wrinkling on the wings and fuselage at load attachment points. Although Supermarine advised that the MK XIVs had not been seriously weakened, nor were they on the point of failure. The RAF nevertheless issued instructions in early 1945 that all F and FR MK XIVs were to be retrospectively fitted with clipped wings. Spitfire XIVs began to arrive in the Southeast Asian theater in June 1945 too late to operate against the Japanese. It was this type which was rumored to have been buried at an airfield in Burma after the war. Equals FR MK 14 equals. 
Late in 1944 a number of high-back full-span MKX IVEs were converted by the Ford repair unit to have a single camera fitted, facing to port or starboard. A conversion identical to that used on the FRU converted FRMKIXC. To achieve this a new hatch, similar to the radio hatch on the port side, was installed on the starboard side, and both hatches were fitted with camera ports in streamlined blisters. Otherwise this version of the FRM KXIVE was essentially the same as the standard aircraft. These field converted aircraft were allocated to 430 Squadron RCAF. Later, purpose built conversions, also known as the FRM KXIVE, had the later cut down rear fuselage with its teardrop euro shaped canopy, port and or starboard camera ports and an additional rear fuel tank of 34 gallons which extended the Spitfire's range to about 610 miles on internal fuel. Because it was used mainly at low altitudes the production FRM KXIV had clipped wingtips. In total, 957 MKXIVs were built, over 430 of which were FRM KXIVs. After the war, second-hand MKXIVs were exported to a number of foreign air forces. 132 went to the Royal Belgian Air Force, 70 went to the Royal Indian Air Force and 30 of its reconnaissance variant went to the Royal Thai Air Force. Equals MK-15 and MK-17 equals, the Mark numbers 15 and 17 were reserved for the naval version, the Sapphire, in an effort to reconcile the Spitfire numbering scheme with that of the Sapphire. Equals MK-18 equals, media related to Supermarine Spitfire Mark 18 at Wikimedia Commons. The MK-18 was a refinement of the MK-14. It was identical in most respects including engine and cockpit enhancements, but it carried extra fuel and had a revised, stronger wing structure. Its handling was also nearly identical and so it was not put through any performance tests. Like the MK-14 there were fighter and fighter reconnaissance variants built. The MK-18 missed the war. It was built up until early 1946 but it was not until January 1947, that an RAF squadron, 60 Squadron which operated from RAF Selita, Singapore, was re-equipped with the variant. Later, other squadrons in the Far East and Middle East would receive them. Some 300 FMK-18s and FRMK-18s were built, before production ended in early 1946. The MK-18s saw little action apart from some involvement against guerrillas in the Malayan emergency. The Royal Indian Air Force purchased 20 XRAF MK-18s in 1947. Equals MK-19 equals, media related to Supermarine Spitfire Mark 19 at Wikimedia Commons, the MK-19 was the last and most successful photographic reconnaissance variant of the Spitfire. It combined features of the MK-11 with a Griffon engine of the MK-14. After the first 25 were produced, later aircraft were also fitted with the pressurized cabin of the MKX and the fuel capacity was increased to 256 gallons, three and a half times that of the original Spitfire. This version was the Type 390. The first MKXIXs entered service in May 1944 and by the end of the war the type had virtually replaced the earlier MK-11. A total of 225 were built with production ceasing in early 1946, but they were used in frontline RAF service until April 1954. In 1951, Hainan Island was targeted at the behest of U.S. naval intelligence for RAF overflights, using Spitfire Prairie MK-19s based at Kai Tak Airport in Hong Kong. The last operational sortie by OMK-19 was in 1963 when one was used in battle trials against an English electric lightning to determine how best a lightning should engage piston-engined aircraft. This information was needed in case RAF lightnings might have to engage P-51 Mustangs in the Indonesian conflict of the time. Equals MK-20 equals Mark 20 was given to the original MK4 Griffon engine prototype DP845 to avoid confusion with the retitled Spitfire Prairie MKIVs. The second MK20, DP851, initially had a Griffon 2 engine and made its first flight in August 1942. In December, it was refitted with a Griffon 61 and redesignated as a MK21 initial prototype. Equals MK21 equals 
media related to Supermarine Spitfire Mark 21 at Wikimedia Commons, by early 1942, it was evident that Spitfires powered by the new two-stage supercharged Griffon 61 engine would need a much stronger airframe and wings. The proposed new design was designated the MK-21. At first the MK-21 displayed poor flight qualities that damaged the otherwise excellent Spitfire reputation. The wings were completely redesigned with a new structure and using thicker gauge light alloy skinning. The new wing was torsionally 47% stiffer, allowing an increased theoretical aileron reversal speed of 825 miles per hour. The ailerons were 5% larger, and were no longer of the Fry's balance type instead being attached by continuous piano hinges. They were extended by 8 inches, meaning that with a straighter trailing edge, the wings were not the same elliptical shape as in previous Spitfires. The MK-21 armament was standardized as 420mm Hispano II cannon with 150 RPG and no machine guns. The Griffon engine drove an 11 feet diameter 5-bladed propeller, some 7 inches larger than that fitted to the MK-14. To ensure sufficient ground clearance for the new propeller, the undercarriage legs were lengthened by 4.5 inches. The undercarriage legs also had a 7.75 inch wider track to help improve ground handling. The designers then devised a system of levers to shorten the undercarriage legs by about 8 inches as they retracted, because the longer legs did not have enough space in which to retract. These same levers extended the legs as they came down. The larger diameter four spoke man heels were strengthened to cope with the greater weights. Post war, these were replaced by wider, reinforced three spoke wheels to allow Spitfires to operate from hard concrete or asphalt runways. When retracted, the wheels were now fully enclosed by triangular doors which were hinged to the outer edge of the wheel wells. In other respects, the first production MK 21s used the same basic airframe as the MK 14. The first true MK-21 prototype, PP-139 first flew in July 1943, with the first production aircraft LA-187 flying on March 15, 1944. However the modifications over the MK-14 made the MK-21 sensitive to trim changes. LA-201's poor flight control qualities, during trials in late 1944 and early 1945 led to a damning report from the Air Fighting Development Unit. It must be emphasized that although the Spitfire 21 is not a dangerous aircraft to fly, pilots must be warned. In its present state it is not likely to prove a satisfactory fighter. No further attempts should be made to perpetuate the Spitfire family. Supermarine was seriously concerned because Castle Bromwich had been converted to produce MK-21s, and more were coming off the production lines daily. Jeffrey Quill commented that the AFDU were quite right to criticize the handling of the Mark 21. Where they went terribly wrong was to recommend that all further development of the Spitfire family should cease. They were quite unqualified to make such a judgment and later events would prove them totally wrong. After intensive test flying the most serious problems were solved by changing the gearing to the trim tabs and other subtle control modifications such that the MK-21 was cleared for instrument flying and low-level flight during trials in March 1945. An AFDU report on LA-215 issued that month noted that the Spitfire 21 was now much easier to fly. General handling the modifications carried out to this aircraft have resulted in an improvement of the general handling characteristics at all heights. Conclusions The critical trimming characteristics reported on the production Spitfire 21 have been largely eliminated by the modifications carried out to this aircraft. Its handling qualities have benefited to a corresponding extent and it is now considered suitable both for instrument flying and low flying. It is considered that the modifications to the Spitfire 21 make it a satisfactory combat aircraft for the average pilot. Spitfire 21s finally became operational on 91 Squadron in January 1945. 91 Squadron had little opportunity to engage the enemy before the war ended, but scored a rare success on April 26, 1945, when two Spitfire MK-21s shot up and claimed to have sunk a German midget submarine which they caught on the surface. 
with the end of the war most orders for the Mk-21 were cancelled and only 120 were completed. In 1946-40 Spitfire 21s were delivered to Shubaruness. Once there their leading edges were removed and destroyed in lethality tests. Some aircraft had less than five hours flying time. Equals Mk-22 equals, media related to Supermarine Spitfire Mark 22 at Wikimedia Commons, the Mk-22 was identical to the Mk-21 in all respects except for the cutback rear fuselage, with the teardrop canopy, and a more powerful 24-volt electrical system in place of the 12-volt system of all earlier Spitfires. Most of the Mk-22s were built with enlarged tail surfaces, similar to those of the Supermarine Spiteful. A total of 287 Mk-22s were built, 260 at Castle Bromwich and 27 by Supermarine at South Marston. The Mk-22 was used by only one regular RAF unit, 73 Squadron based on Malta. However 12 squadrons of the Royal Auxiliary Air Force used the variant and continued to do so until March 1951. The Mk-22 was also used at flying refresher schools. In May 1955 the remaining F-22s were declared obsolete for all RAF purposes and many were sold back to Vickers Armstrongs for refurbishment and were then sold to the Southern Rhodesian, Egyptian and Syrian Air Forces. Equals Mk-23 equals the Mk-23 was to be a Mk-22 incorporating a revised wing design which featured an increase in incidence, lifting the leading edge by two inches. It was hoped that this would improve the pilot's view over the nose in flight and increase the high speed and dive performance of the aircraft. The modified, hand-built wing was first fitted to Mkhag-204 which was tested from July 1944. However the tests were disappointing and, after discussions at Supermarine, it was decided to build a new prototype using the Mk-21 prototype PP-139, in this form the prototype was designated FMK-23, and was to be renamed the Supermarine Valiant. However the new wing gave less than perfect handling characteristics and so the Mk-23 was never built from the Mk-22 airframe as intended. Equals Mk-24 equals media related to Supermarine Spitfire Mark 24 at Wikimedia Commons. The final Spitfire variant, the Mk-24, was similar to the Mk-22 except that it had an increased fuel capacity over its predecessors, with two fuel tanks of 33 gallons each installed in the rear fuselage. There were also zero-point fittings for rocket projectiles under the wings. All had the larger spiteful tail units, Modifications were also made to the trim tab gearings in order to perfect the FMK-24's handling characteristics. The FMK-24 achieved a maximum speed of 454 miles per hour, and could reach an altitude of 30,000 feet in 8 minutes, putting it on a par with the most advanced piston engine fighters of the era. Although designed primarily as a fighter interceptor aircraft, the Spitfire proved its versatility in several different roles. In fighter configuration the FMK-24's armament consisted of four a, short-barreled Mk-5 20mm Hispano cannon a Euro operational experience had proved that the hitting power of these larger weapons was necessary to overcome the thicker armored plating encountered on enemy aircraft as the war progressed. The aircraft also served successfully in the fighter-bomber role, being capable of carrying one a, 500 pounds and two a, 250 pounds bombs, with rocket projectile launch rails fitted as standard. Late production aircraft were built with the lighter, short-barreled, electrically fired Mark V Hispano cannon. A total of 81 Mk-24s were completed, 27 of which were conversions from Mk-22s. The last Mk-24 to be built was delivered in February 1948. They were used by only one RAF squadron, 80 squadron, until 1952. Some of the squadron's aircraft went to the Hong Kong Auxiliary Air Force where they were operated until 1955. Introduced into service in 1946, the FMK-24 differed greatly from the original Spitfire MKI in many respects and was twice as heavy, more than twice as powerful and showed an increase in climb rate of 80% over that of the prototype, K-5054. 
These remarkable increases in performance arose chiefly from the introduction of the Rolls-Royce Griffon engine in place of the famous Merlin of earlier variants. Rated at 2,050 horsepower, the 12-cylinder V-liquid-cooled Griffon 61 engine featured a two-stage supercharger, giving the Spitfire the exceptional performance at high altitude that had been sometimes lacking in early marks. Production after the destruction of the main Itchen and Wollstone works by the Luftwaffe in September 1940, all supermarine manufactured Spitfires were built in a number of shadow factories. By the end of the war there were ten main factories and several smaller workshops which built many of the components. The main Castle Bromwich factory was also aided by a smaller number of the shadow factories. The breakdown of production figures is taken from Air International 1985. Pages 187. Information as to when the first production aircraft emerged is from the serial number lists provided in Morgan and Shackler D2000. Because the first XIVs were converted from existing MK8 airframes the first true production serial no is listed. Protracted development of the MK21 meant that this variant did not reach operational service until January 1945. Specification Spitfire General characteristics Crew, 1 pilot, length, 32 feet 8 inches, wingspan, 36 feet 10 in, height, 10 feet, wing area, 242.1 feet 2, airfoil, NACA 2209.4, tip, empty weight, 6,578 pounds, loaded weight, 7,923 pounds, max takeoff weight, 8,488 pounds, power plant, 1A, Rolls-Royce Griffon 65, supercharged V12 engine, 5 bladed jar blow rotor propeller, 2,050 horsepower at 8,000 feet. Performance. Maximum speed, 448 miles per hour, combat radius, 400 mi, ferry range, 950 mi, 1,090 miles, 1,815 kilometers, Service ceiling, 43,500 feet, rate of climb, 3,650 feet per minute, wing loading, 32.72 pounds per foot 2, power mass, 0.24 horsepower per pound. Armament. Guns, 2A, 20mm Hispano MK2 cannon, 120RPG. 4A, 0.303 in Browning machine guns. 350 RPG. Replaced by 2X.50 and M2 Browning machine guns 250 RPG MKXIVE. Bombs, 2A, 250 pounds bombs. See also, British Military History of World War II, Rolls-Royce Merlin and Griffon, Supermarine, Allied Technological Cooperation During World War II, Related Development, Supermarine S6B, Sapphire, Spiteful, Seafoam. References. Equals citations equals. Equals bibliography equals. Equals videography equals. External links. Manual. AP. 1565T and WPN. Pilot's notes for Spitfire 14 and 19. The Spitfire site. The Spitfire Society. Alan Lamarinal hosts Supermarine Spitfire. Spitfire performance testing. Spitfire Sapphire serial numbers, production contracts and aircraft histories, Spitfire, while bird alley a Euro information about Spitfire still flying today, K5054 a Euro Supermarine Type 300 prototype Spitfire and production aircraft history, the Spitfire, 70 years on a Euro includes images of the factory, National Heritage while bird foundation.